Hello and welcome to the Siphon and Credibility podcast. Um, so our guest today is James Kiersteed, the classics lecturer or one of the classics lecturers at Vic. Um, so James, would you like to just tell us a bit about yourself and your qualifications? Sure, yeah. So I'm, I'm James Kiersteed. I, I teach here at Vic, as you know. I teach you guys. Yep. Um, and uh, I did classics at Oxford. That was my BA. Fancy. And then fancy, yeah. And then I did, uh, did an MA in London and then I moved to California and I... Uh, I was lucky enough to work with um, a really great expert in the in Athenian democracy who's called Josiah Ober, who works at Stanford University. So I did my dissertation with Josh, and that was in 2013 when I finished that. Hmm. And uh, now I'm here. Cool. It's quite a big name university, is that? Yeah. Stanford, yeah, yeah. Like Stanford, Oxford. Oxford. Yeah, I don't know. I always seem to have slipped through the cracks. Yeah. You know, <laughs> so I've been, I've been pretty lucky. Yeah. yeah, you made your way in. You said you didn't have that much credibility, but where... Uh... Oxford yeah, and Stanford. This is a big name. It's very um, prestigious, actually. Yeah. So our our topics for today is basically all about Greek or Athenian democracy in particular. So do you want to just give us a quick rundown of uh, the very, very, very basics of how the Athenian democracy worked? Okay, so basically there are several different institutions in Athenian democracy. Um, the main one, the most important one, is probably the assembly. And uh, the assembly is basically just a big meeting of people. Or, or more specifically, and this is a theme we'll probably come back to, it's a meeting of citizen males, right? So you have to be you have to be male to turn up. But if you're male and, and you're a citizen, you have the right um, you know, genealogy, you have the right pakapakwa. You can turn up to the assembly and you vote directly on, on policy. Um, so that's the main thing. The assembly is where you know direct voting on policy gets done. And then there's another institution which is really important called the council. Um, and the council is allotted. It uses what some people call sortition. So it's selection by lot. And there are 500 people who are selected for the council every year. And the council, uh, the main role of the council is to prepare business for the assembly. So the council will, will come up with an agenda uh, and, and we'll take it to the assembly and then the, then the people who come to the assembly will, uh, will vote on those things and also discuss them and they can change things around a little bit. Um, and then there is also um, the, the, the legal systems and, and this, the legal system in Athens was uh, focused on popular jurors. Uh, so you have these mass Juries, you, you may remember the, the trial of Socrates had 501 jurors, and that's pretty typical. Often they would have 401, 201, depending on the kind of case. And again, the, these jurors were selected by lot from the whole of, of the citizen population. Uh, and then you have uh, what's sometimes called the magistracies, or the sort of state officials. And these are just sort of roles that, you know, need to get, things need to get done in the, in the state. And so, you know, somebody uh, gets selected to be, uh, you know, uh, a superintendent of the marketplace. How are they uh, selected? Is it by lot? Well, that's well? a good question. So overwhelmingly, the magistracies are selected by lot. Okay. And that's a really key feature of ancient democracy, uh, which maybe we can talk about more mm. later because I find it especially interesting. Uh, but there were elections too. But it's just that elections were only for particular offices. So what one really big exception to the rule of uh, sortition for public offices was the generalship. So that, that was one of the most powerful offices in Athens. They had 10 generals and they were elected. And so Pericles, for example, who's a very influential figure, one of, his, one of the main sources of his power was that he was re-elected general, uh, you know, year after year. Um, so, so, so we've got the assembly, we've got the council, we've got the legal system or the, the popular courts, the magistracies. And the final thing I should mention is uh, ostracism because that's uh, it's also a part of the democracy. And ostracism is basically this this institution that seems a bit funny uh, to our eyes, uh, although often when you mention it to people, they think, oh, we should get that back. And, and because basically what ostracism allows you to do is to expel a politician for 10 years. It's not a legal punishment. It's not like they've committed a crime. It's just a kind of safety valve thing. That, and how, how do you do it? Is it a popular vote? Yeah, yeah so you have, you, have a vote, you, have, you have a vote uh, first as to whether you need to have an ostracism that year. So they're like, shall we have an ostracism this year? And if the vote that is positive and you go down from the Pnyx to the Agora which is the ancient sort of town square and then uh, people would write the name of the politician they wanted to be sent away for 10 years on a, on a bit of pottery or what we call a shirt of pottery and it gets a bit complicated because we don't even know how many people in Athens were literate so so there's some evidence that maybe uh, other people were writing names for them and there'd be these stalls set up saying you know if you want to ostracize Themistocles come over here and, and things like that uh, but anyway, if there was a, if there was a simple majority uh, for a particular figure, that figure would get ostracized. He gets sent away for ten years, and of course, uh, 
we know that this happened uh, through the fifth century. And, and then at some point it, it sort of stops. They stop using it uh, for whatever reason. But for the fifth century, it's very much a part of the democratic uh, order. Okay, well that kind of takes us to a point that we were going to touch on later, but it seems to lead on from an ostracism thing. So what sort of checks and balances, as we in the modern world call it, did the Athenian democracy have? So we've got ostracism, and what, what stopped, because they were obviously very anti-tyranny, but what sort of stuff was in place to prevent You could argue tyranny? that um, electing people via our own lot, rather than actually, well, phrase that badly, but actually putting people in power based on lot, not by our elections, could also be a sort of check and balance. Because you see this later in the Roman system where maybe Julius Caesar is extremely popular and by that he gets all the power. He so gets in the voted Athenian in every system, time. So like you said with the Pericles, he was extremely influential and this was via him essentially maintaining his position as a strategoi. But you couldn't actually completely gain uh, power in Athens due to the fact that many positions were based on lot rather than actual election. Yeah, so I think that... Um I think it's complicated because I think the phrase checks, uh, check and, checks and balances. Or it's a very modern one. Yeah, exactly. And it's, it's specifically a phrase that comes in um, after people start talking about uh, what's known as the mixed constitution. And, and this actually goes back to ancient writers. So Polybius, for example, Polybius of Megalopolis, uh, he was one of the main authors who thought uh, about this idea of the balanced constitution that had a little bit of democracy, a little bit of oligarchy, uh, and a little bit, little bit of monarchy. And that, that really influenced both thinkers in France and thinkers in, in the United States, uh, even before, even slightly before the United States was a thing. So people like James Madison, they were very keen on the mixed constitution, and they were very keen on things like checks and balances, the idea that the different branches of government mm. would balance each other out. Now, that's not an idea that they, that they seem to have had in ancient Greek democracies. However, I would say that in, in some ways they, they get to the same place by a different route, uh, because power is dispersed. So it's completely right what you're saying. It's very hard to um, monopolize power in classical Athens. And the, and the Athenians know that. I mean, the system is, is designed in a way which, which makes that very difficult to do. So, um, so what, what, in what way is it designed that way? So you've got the by lots and you've got the ostracism if it gets really bad. Mm-hmm. And what else? Is, is there term limits and that sort of stuff on, on the roles? Yeah, exactly. So, so term limits are interesting because in, in the modern world we think of term limits as in, oh, you know, four years for legislators, maybe six years, I don't know, in some systems, um, uh, maybe even 10 years, uh, you know, depending on what kind of role that you're playing in a modern representative democracy. In the ancient world, it tends to be, in, in ancient democracies anyway, it tends to be one year. So you only get one year. Um, uh, some of them are non-repeatable, some of them you can serve twice, um, but that's pretty much all you get. And uh, and so, you know, you may, be, you may be general. Even if you're general, of course, you're on a board with, with nine other generals. But you may be general, but you, it's very hard for you, it's going to be very hard for you to monopolize all the other sources of power because you just can't be everywhere, you know. Um, and I think, you know, if you, look at, if you look at more monarchical systems, more autocratic systems, uh, there's often a drift towards, you know, the supreme leader uh, politically also tends to gather a lot of religious powers and cultural powers and even legal powers. I mean, that's certainly the case with the, with the Roman and later the Byzantine emperors. But, it, it, but the whole democratic system is set up so that, so that different citizens, lots of different citizens, actually have a, have a role to play. And, and um, so what, what do you think about ostracism? Is that, is that a legitimate system, do you think, that, that could be used? Is, did, was, it, was it a positive for them? Or was it just kind a, of a... It's a good question, because, you know, nowadays... Well, another thing that people talk uh, argue about when they talk about ancient democracy was, did they have an idea of um, human rights? Did they have an idea of the rule of law? Uh, uh, and, you know, if you just stick with the human rights idea, I think nowadays a big objection to let's kick someone out for 10 years is They, they is didn't that, do anything wrong. Yeah, it would, be, it would seem kind of arbitrary. Like, mm. just because you don't like a given politician, are you allowed to, like, kick them out of New Zealand and say, yeah. you're not allowed to come to your home country? Uh, so that would seem... I think Perhaps you could go harsh. with a more mediated version of it, like um, like they did, like uh, I think it was Marius who did it in Rome, where it's you you can stay, but you just can't hold office. Yeah. Um. So you're not kicked out physically, but you yeah. your power is is basically gone. Well, you know, I'm 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 sort of happy in the modern world just with the idea: if you don't like a politician, don't vote for them, mm. and then you know, and hopefully if enough, if enough other people agree with you, they won't be in office. I think that, that that's probably enough. I so, mean, so you don't need this big 
check him out for. Yeah, I mean, I think in the ancient world, um, there was a lot of hurly burly, and I mean by hurly burly, uh, it happened a lot in Greek city states. The people would kill one another. They get into situations of so-called stasis or civil strife, which was basically often you know full-on civil war. And you have these purges. You know, the oligarchs would purge the Democrats when they got in. Democrats would purge the oligarchs, and, and vice versa. And so, you know, ostracism can be seen partly as a way of trying to uh, avoid that situation. So, so it's the lesser of the two evils, yeah. rather ostracize yeah, someone yeah. who has a civil war. Yeah, and I don't think that we're, you know, certainly not in New Zealand, we're not quite at that, at that place where we need to, you know, ostracize politicians to avoid civil war. I mean, yeah. hopefully, hopefully, hopefully not. Hopefully not. Yeah. yeah, we have a, we have a pretty peaceful transition this, of power. Yeah, this actually leads into the uh, next question, which is the pros and cons of Greek democracy. Like, what are the actual benefits that it had? So, for example, the other day, Jacob and I were talking about how democracy is just pragmatically beneficial because it prevents civil war. If you forget about anything else, it helps reduce the amount of civil war because people will vote on something rather yeah, than fight about it. Yeah, have sort of an outlet rather than... So, so, in terms of like pure pragmatism, what sort of like advantages did the, did the Athenians kind of have? From well, so, so this is, I guess there are two questions here. One is, are there systematic advantages that come from having a democratic system? Yeah, I mean, and, specifically... And even, even a representative system. Um, and that's a question that I'm not really fully qualified to talk about, actually, because you, what you need to, to do there is go to quantitative political scientists, you know, empirical mm-hmm. political scientists. Yeah, but I'm, I'm thinking um, more in like, like, like for Athens, for example, in the Peloponnesian War, was being a democracy a, right, right. a negative or a positive for them? Yeah, so that, that's a complicated question. I and mean, it's good, actually, I've just mentioned empirical political scientists because it's very difficult in history to tease out causation. Uh, so okay, we can we can say things like uh, Athens lost the Peloponnesian War. That's true, right? Um, and actually, a lot of uh, historiographers, a lot of the sort of upper class people who wrote uh, about this period throughout history, they've sort of used that as a knockdown argument against Athenian democracy, right? Yeah. They lost the Peloponnesian War, so their system sucked. Correlation, not causation. Well, well quite. You know, so it, you have to be a bit more careful than that. So there's been a little bit of more sort of statistical work and. Uh, some of it seems to suggest that the best performing regimes are actually moderate oligarchies. <laughs> Although that, that's controversial. So would you call Sparta, <laughs> was Sparta a moderate well, oligarchy that, or were they... Yeah, uh, no, no, there's a lot you can write on how exactly you classify these systems. Yeah. But yeah, I think, uh, I think a lot of people would call Sparta a reasonably moderate oligarchy. Uh, but so the, the way I look at this question in the ancient world especially uh, is more in this way that so the ancient democratii were, were really quite radical democracies in some ways, you know, in terms of how much power they gave the citizens, not in terms of their, their franchises. So if you think of direct democracy in the modern world, if you have conversations about direct democracy, often people will say to you, well, it's a great idea, and you know, it sounds like a good sort of moral thing, but it's just not going to work. And, and assume, if we had a system like that, everything would just go to hell in a handbasket, whatever that means, right? Um, <clears throat> But if you look at the ancient case, the, the Athens, for example, just take one case, they had a pretty robust direct democracy for almost 200 years, around about 200 years. And how do they do? So, and then this is, this is the important methodological point again. Not, don't just look at the Peloponnesian War, that's just one war. Okay? Mm. We put it in our data set, but it's just one thing. If you look at the whole course of Athenian history, how, does it, how do they stack up against other, other regimes? Very, very competitive environment, by the way. It's not like anyone's giving them uh, you know, a free pass or anything. And the answer is they do pretty damn well. Okay, so with Athens, then again, method, methodology is important. You have to say, well, okay, they were especially big. They had all these resources like silver at Laurium. They had a really good position you know, on the map. They had geographical advantages. But you know, at least it, it knocks down that, that very strong reaction to direct democracy, which is that, oh, if you have direct democracy, it's going to ruin everything. It, it, actually, what, what the Greek and the Athenian case, cases suggest is that uh, direct democracy does not uh, you know, automatically render your state completely worthless. Of course, there's a there's a there's a difference between being worthless and not as good as perhaps you can be. Mm. As in, a direct democracy might not make your state in, immediately fall into the rubble, but it might make it um, less efficient than perhaps perhaps it could be. Um, yeah, yeah. So, That's, for example, right. to phrase the question a different way, if Athens was say a Spartan style oligarchy, do you think it would have been? I mean, of course, this is very hypothetical, but do you think it could have been more or less successful? Yeah, I mean, that's a very difficult question to answer. Um, and it's actually, it's interesting because Sparta was another one of these polis that were like exceptionally large and, and had exceptional resources. Uh, but of course, there are all these weird things about Sparta which make it hard to 
talk about exactly what's driving Spartan success. You know, they're dominating the helots and stuff like that. Yeah, having so, slaves makes a efficient government quite easy. Well, I mean, of course, they all had slaves. Just that they, yeah, they, they had a particular institutional yeah, they had mass a particularly slavery. brutal, and they had a peculiar type of slavery. But I'd say so. Um, it, so I, it, it may well be the case. I don't know, and this is a controversial and difficult topic or a difficult subject to go into. It may well be the case that Athens would have performed slightly better had it been less democratic. Um, personally, I don't believe that, but, but maybe that's true. So this is when you bring in, it might be interesting to bring in the moral side mm. of the argument. So this is when you talk about direct democracy, people will often, um, they'll often admit, okay, it sounds like a good system morally because everybody gets a say, but the only problem is it's not practicable. And I think if you look at Greek history, what it suggests is you can't actually, you can't actually have the, the advantages, the moral advantages of direct democracy, and you'll do pretty well. So, the question, so then the question for citizens, I guess, is do you want to just like crush everybody and have a moderate oligarchy? Or do you want to have a direct democracy which has all these moral advantages? And do, and do like well. pretty well. You know, yeah. and, do, so, and, um, and you have to, you know, the, the, we've been looking at the performance aspect. The performance here meaning not getting killed, which is very important. State death. It's very important to, the, to, uh, to, to states in human history not to get completely killed. Because, I mean, you, you actually, you know, as you said, state death, what, what actually happens is that all the male citizens get killed and the, you know, the women and children get sold into slavery. So you definitely want to avoid that. But there are other things to life. And if you, if you look at the Athens and Sparta comparison, you know, the Sparta thing, you, you know, people say Sparta was entirely a military camp. It's a bit of an overstatement. But it still seems to be true that Athens produced a lot of culture, a lot of philosophy and poetry and, and so on and so forth. People enjoyed various types of good in that democracy, which maybe weren't as available in, in less open systems. Yeah. Um, and also, I just want to get into some of the specific negatives of the Athenian democracy. So there, one, a really obvious one, which kind of cries out to us now as, well, male citizens is a very specific, very specific niche. Mm -hmm. But um, but like what other sort of stuff was like specific wrongs with the democracy? Because, for example, we just wrote an essay on uh, how it was very vulnerable to like demagoguery and mm. because you could legit just give speeches right at the forum before everyone voted or so not the forum at the uh and the politics. yeah before everyone voted um so that seems a bit and you could really rile them up so like what sort of stuff was like the specific problems that if you if you could go back to ancient Athens you're like we keep it on direct democracy but we do this this and this well i think the, the overwhelming one is the one that you just mentioned that it, it was exclusionary uh, and that's, I think, where we are. We do better than the than the ancients uh, in terms of democracy. I think when we talk about democracy, uh, you know, it's important to remember it has these two elements: democratia. It has the people and the power element. The, you know, the the power of the people. And I think that we do very well in in giving something, giving citizenship to lots and lots of people, including women, including even people who are just resident foreigners like me in New Zealand. I have some. I have a lot of rights actually. And you get them reasonably quickly, uh, and of course we don't have slaves nowadays. <laughs> so that's Damn it. And, and that you know that actually you know took a long time in human history for that to happen. That's and that's a great thing, um, and so we do a lot better on the on those fronts than the ancients, and that's and that's very important to remember. However, I think that you know as I said before, they actually gave their citizens power, and this is the problem with with us. So we've got lots of citizens, but every, not much power. Everybody's a citizen, but what can you do with that? And, and you, know, you can do a little bit, and it helps a lot, but. But ultimately, you know, in New Zealand, you vote every th once every three years. If you're an ancient Athenian citizen, you could go down to the assembly, you know, once a week. Um, of course, then there's all these problems of scale and, you know, how do you make it possible for people to vote that often? Um, but I think we could probably do a bit more in the modern world. But anyway, just to go back to, to that question, so I, I would stress, I think, that that's the, most, that, that's the most important negative about ancient democracy. It's always, always worth bearing in mind. It was very exclusionary, and, and it, was a, it was ultimately a minority of the population that we're talking about when we talk about uh, the, the citizen democracy, uh, the male citizen democracy. Now, uh, the, the demagogue point is a, is a slightly more slippery and, and complicated one because uh, you have to be aware of the bias of some of our sources. So we have uh, sources like Thucydides, uh, people like that who were, who were aristocrats, and they were very intelligent. Uh, people, well, Thucydides uh, certainly was, uh, but of course, um, you know, when 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 Thucydides criticizes someone like Cleon, he's doing it from his own perspective. And uh, Moses Finley, I don't know if you know this uh, ancient historian who who was uh, 
who's an American who was actually expelled from the States in the McCarthy era. Yeah, okay. Lots of people were expelled from yeah, the States yeah. well, in the McCarthy era. Yeah, well, he was and he went to, went to Cambridge, and it was kind of the U.S.'s loss was Britain's gain. Hmm. Anyway, he, he wrote a, a book about Athenian democracy, in which he has a classic essay about demagoguery. And he basically says, demagogues were basically, uh, you know, demagogues were a feature of the system. Demagogues were just people who spoke in the assembly, and the people who didn't like them would then say, oh, you're riling up the people. But of course, if you were on their side, you would have said, oh, they're... They're giving, yeah. they're informing the people and right. just convincing them. And this is a classic thing with Thucydides, that he's like, oh, Cleon's a terrible person, he's a demagogue. Pericles, though, that guy's great. Yeah, I mean, if yeah. you actually read, like, because, I mean, I was reading Thucydides recently for, for that essay, and you read the way that he talks about Cleon, it's like, it's very emotional language you know he's like that's right he, yeah. he riled up the people he wasn't talking to yeah, the people yeah. he wasn't convincing them he was he was angering them and who um, knows i mean maybe cleon had a slightly different speaking style but i think it's definitely it's worth bearing in mind at the very least that there's this there's this class inflection to it too that thucydides he thinks pericles is more the type of chap that you'd want to have as a leader and cleon and people like that the people the, the politicians who came from the lower classes that, that those weren't as good as far as the cities was concerned. So would you say that for Athens, the, dem the demagoguery issue wasn't that as big of a problem as we kind of think it is now? Yeah, basically. I mean, I think that uh, it's, I think it's still the case today that uh, when people call politicians a demagogue, it basically means, I don't like this politician. Yeah, so it's just, it's just a condemnation of their policy. Yeah, and, which, and which, which of course is perfectly legitimate. Yeah, I mean, you um, can do that. But, but I don't think it's... Uh, it's it's a good criticism of democracy to say it produces demagogues because what you know what's the alternative? Because yeah, I mean, really, is a demi I mean, a demagogue then is just an equivalent now to a to a candidate. Really, it's somebody who uses democracy to get ahead. Yeah, um, potentially more grassroots support. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, so that that would segue into a conversation about what people mean exactly by populism. And, and in my view, you know, populism is one of these words that basically means democracy when I don't like it. Yeah, yeah, definitely, because because that's the thing. If you if you're only democratic when uh, when it's going your way, it's like the free speech thing. If you're only democratic when you're going your way, is it really democracy? Well, quite yeah. Um, yeah. And if it's not, then it becomes then it becomes popularism and and abuse of the abuse of the system. Um, but yeah, um, that kind of uh, do we want to move on to? I on actually to, to bring up something. Could you argue that the Athenian system was? easily abusable in the sense that Cleon, although you said he might not have been a demagogue in the uh, same way Thucydides represented him, that he still was able to abuse the system where you could essentially flood, I can't remember what the name of it was, the assembly? Was that where they all like uh, voted? Yeah. Yeah. So essentially he could flood the assembly with tons of his supporters and essentially shout down opponents of his mm. to essentially get his point across rather than anyone else, and essentially use that to win any vote that occurred. Yeah, so, so again, I mean, that may, be, that may have been the case. Like, I don't remember the particular passages you might have in mind, but um, you have to be aware of the bias of the sources. And uh, so w one thing I think w which is true, about, and which is a difference between ancient and modern democracy, at least in a lot of places, is that there was a lot of hubbub in, in ancient democratic fora. Uh, we often hear about this thorubos, which is the Greek word meaning kind of people shouting stuff. Uh, and you still get that actually in the British uh, House of Parliament. Yeah, it's fun watching <laughs> it. Sorry? It's fun watching it. Yeah, yeah fun. in the House of Commons. Um, and, you know, to some extent comments. in Canada and New Zealand. Uh, the States, they tend to be a bit more, a bit more polite, uh, at least in Congress. Um, but uh, anyway, I, I, I would be aware of seeing all that kind of stuff as something that only only Cleon did and it's something that was that was crazily illegitimate I mean effectively he's, if that's true he's just sort of mobilizing supporters and I'm sure that the the other sides were, were, were doing the same thing but yeah. would you not say that that's an inherent flaw of the system that you can do that rather than because at that point it's not really pure democracy anymore because not everyone is getting to or would would you say that people being ill-informed before their decision means that their decision is less their own as in, for example, say Cleon bursts in and doesn't let anyone else talk, and then they vote after only Cleon's talk. Is that a flaw for democracy, or is that just Cleon being smart, or is it both? Okay, well, I guess we're we're, we're getting a bit far away from like what the sources tell us that Cleon actually did, but mm. I, I kind of know the, the sort of thing that you have in mind. Uh, I mean, going back to the Thorubos thing, the hubbub. I, I mean, I personally think that 
we should try and be quite deliberative and discuss things in a rational manner. So I'm not a, a huge fan of, uh, of that kind of thing. Shutting everyone down. Yeah, and, and you have to, so one thing about the ancient uh, democratic assemblies were, were, was that they were very large by our standards. So the Athenian ecclesia, the Athenian assembly, uh, we think that probably had five or 6,000 people in it, uh, you know, at any one, at any one meeting. We, we know, well, we think that 6,000 was often a quorum, um, and we think that the space on the Pnyx where people went well, often was, was, was set up so that there were around 6,000 people. But anyway, 6,000 people is a big group of people. Yeah, I mean, um, compared to our modern parliaments. Yeah, it's like the TSB arena. Yeah. Like once I went to see Billy Connolly in the TSB arena, there was about 6,000 people. It's a big, big space. If you're Billy Connolly, you can do it, and you feel comfortable speaking because you have a lot of experience. But like, not a lot, and this is what was one thing that people do say about the Athenian Assembly. So there would have been a very intimidating space. So even though in theory everybody could stand up and speak, you wouldn't because there's six thousand yeah, people. So it looks like from the sources there's a, there, there is some kind of bias towards the more self confident people, the better educated people, the people from the more aristocratic backgrounds felt more comfortable uh, getting up and speaking. And, and that that I think is a problem. There are also sources which tell us that um, shoemakers and common people did sometimes stand up and speak. So it wasn't like they never spoke, but it, did, it does seem to be yeah. There's a, there's a, a, bias. There's a bias against them. In those yeah. cases that they did speak up, were they actually listened to, or were they just disregarded as like uh, they didn't have the authority of people who like were more influential in the system? Well, it's hard to say because uh, as often with ancient history, our evidence isn't that good. We we don't know that much about uh, these types. Um, we have some speeches in Thucydides uh, by people uh, who we never hear of again in the sources. So either they're people that so for example Diodotus in the Mytilenean debate. So that's obviously that, that's either a guy that we never hear from again. He was just like a normal dude, not particularly prominent, or, or Thucydides just made him up. Um, but the, what I was referring to before is like we have complaints. For example, Socrates and Plato's Protagoras uh, basically complains that when it comes to matters of state, anyone in Athens can stand up and speak, and that includes people like shoemakers. Which, you know... Oh, God, what shoemakers? Well, exactly. What the hell are they? Well, Socrates' point isn't so much the snobbery one as... What do they know about the science of politics? Mm. You know? Sure, but what does anyone know? I mean, we're, who's yeah. speaking or who's voting? Either way, people who don't know about the science of politics are going to be are going to be contributing to your government if you have a if you have a democracy. Oh, yeah, I, which I, I guess, if you're Socrates, you're maybe not a fan of. I agree with what you said. Yeah. Um, but so, just to kind of take it back or all the way back a little bit, and maybe we should have opened with this. But Athens was democratic, and lots of Greece was. It wasn't Athens wasn't an outlier. So, and I remember you, you started our lectures with this. So why do you think that Greece in particular was such a, I mean, relatively egalitarian and why did that develop into democracies where it really didn't in most parts of the world? So, okay. So, so I guess there are two different claims here. One is that there were lots of democracies in ancient Greece. I think it's certainly true that there were, there were more democracies than we used to think about. People used to just focus on Athens for pretty good reasons because it has the most evidence. But um, there's this guy at um, University of Indiana, Eric Robinson, who's been going around collecting all of the sources that we have, all the evidence for other democracies. And he finds that actually, you know, there, there were a lot of other democracies out there. Again, ancient history, we don't have a lot of evidence, but it seems like uh, it's pretty clear there were, there were many more democracies uh, out there. Uh, some of them before, they were, were democratic before Athens was, right? So it wasn't just Athens that was driving this whole phenomenon. And there's a slightly different point, which is um, that uh, the, the Greece as a whole, the Greek city-states, were more egalitarian than comparable systems around at the same time. And uh, I think that's, that's also true. So we have to bear in mind, you know, Greek city-states sometimes had tyrants, you know, they sometimes had monarchs, or rarely. Uh, they, had, they definitely had oligarchies, some of them weren't very moderate at all. Um, but if you compare them to what's going on in Achaemenid in Persia, or a bit earlier in the Neo-Assyrian Empire, they look pretty... Uh, egalitarian. Yeah, would, you, would you like to just give us a 30-second dispensation on the uh, Neo-Assyrian Empire? Well, I, I, Lots I, I, of spiking. <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't there a tower of flayed people or something? Yeah. <laughs> well, there's a lot of that. Okay. I, don't yeah. to, I don't want to caricature the Neo-Assyrian yeah. Empire. <laughs> it's, it's just, I remember that from your lectures quite clearly. I just wrote yeah. in my notes, Neo-Assyrian Empire, very bad. Well, you know, the... I'll, I'll let you make the moral judgments for yourself. <laughs> yeah. but, you know, I, try and, people. I try and give a vivid uh, uh, image in the, in, in the minds of the students of, of what various uh, uh, various polities are up to. 
But no, I mean, there's no doubt about it. The ancient world was full of warfare, and you, you got to give them credit, the, the Assyrians, that they're very good at it. They're really effective <laughs> they, at it. And they chose the something to be good at, it and they, they, they didn't. Well, they didn't just choose. I mean, in a sense, they chose. But this is the pattern for all, um, you know, ancient states, and and for most states in human history. The main point of them is is to make war. I, I, you know that I like this Charles Tilly quotation: "War makes states, and states make war." And that's really what these these ancient states were. They, they were machines for making war. So, so yeah, Syria and Achaemenid Persia, and you can choose any one of the international age kingdoms. Uh, they have a very similar structure, which is a sort of big man at the top, uh, monopolizes all the resources, monopolizes all the power. He's kind of best mates with the gods, uh, that, that sort of thing. And Do you want to just explain, like, really quickly what you mean by the best mates with the gods thing? Well, I mean... Because I think it's quite an important aspect of, of those dictatorships, if you will. Um, yeah, well, yeah, dictatorship. I don't know if I use well, that term, uh, sorry, I, know, I know what you mean. Yeah. Know it's, it, Auto- autocratic yeah, monarchy. Yeah, yeah. Or, or something along those lines. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, you know, there's often the claim that the, uh, that the ruler's family is related to the gods, like in Egypt, or that, um, you know, the, the Achaemenid Persian monarch is best friends with Ahura Mazda. You know, if you look at the Behistun inscription, there's the Ahura Mazda, who's a sort of winged figure, is flood, fluttering right over uh, where Darius is with his sort of chain of prisoners that he's dominating. So these kind of claims are, are routine. And, and you notice that it's not like, it's not like the Greeks were sort of um, ethnically uh, inoculated from this kind of thing. Because he, once they, once individual Greeks or Macedonians get that sort of power, they do the same, They go to the same place, and that's exactly what happens with Alexander. Almost happens with Philip. Almost happens with uh, various other people like Lysander, uh, uh, Demetrius Polyarchetes. So there are several figures in Greek history who try and do it. But in general, in archaic and classical Greek history, what we have is something different. You, you of course, there are deeply religious people. Or a lot of them are. Uh, but they don't see, you know, religious claims don't back up political power in quite the same way. Um, and so, so, you know, a question you might ask is, how does this come about? And I think what, one big thing is just the, the Bronze Age crash happens, you know, around 1200, as you know, everything just goes to pot. Um, and uh, there's a good book that came out last year, Walter Scheidel, uh, The Great Leveler, which looks at um, economic inequality. Uh, through human history. And he basically says that one of the only things that allows equality to come into being and to increase is catastrophe. Uh, because if you, have, if you have a system that works for, for a long time, it's very easy for the, the elite and the more successful people to, to keep gathering uh, money and power into their own hands. And the only thing which kind of wipes the slate clean is just if everything, <laughs> everything just goes to pot. And that's what happened around 1200. Uh, however, you know, you, you look at when Assyria gets back on its feet in the form of the Neo-Assyrian Empire, it goes a pretty hierarchical route again. So the question is, you know, what is it about Greece? Yeah, that yeah what's, what's that the period? difference? And there are there various theories. I mean, so one thing I think I mentioned in the lecture is this idea of the uh, bronze shortage, that the, the trading links with the Near East uh, sort of fall down and the Greeks have to turn to iron ore. Iron ore is more sort of spread around the place. Uh, you don't have to be in charge of a trade network to get it, like with uh, bronze and uh, uh, tin. So it doesn't lend itself to as complex of a of a state needing to exist. Is is that kind of what you're saying there? No, so just, you don't have to have as high a position in society in order to monopolize so, that yeah, particular so you, resource. So you could be or any, get, get access to that any class resource. level, and you'd be able to have iron. That, that that's the idea. I mean, that's one one theory that people have put out there. Um, so there's this economic aspect to it, and you, you can see that like once we get into the classical period, you know, a rich person in Athens. Uh, the, the, the elite, the top 1% of, of wealth in Athens. Uh, these people are kind of, they're, they, you know, they're often taxed by being made to pay for something like a warship. And, and that will cost you, I don't know, something like three to six talents of silver a year. And if you read in some of the, uh, re- read about some of the Persians around the same time, some of the Persian satraps, the, the regional governors, they're giving gifts to the, to the great king of thousands of talents of silver, uh, you know, as a one-off. So, 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 you know, even the, the most elite people in a Greek polis, they're really, they, they, they're nothing compared to the, to the rich guys in the, in the Near East. But the poor people are, are just as poor. In well, actually, the, the, that's another interesting point. So, just mentioned Walter Shadell, his book, The Great Leveler. He also did a paper a while back about, um, you know, looking at the, the, the amount of food that you get as a, 
uh, I think it's a skilled labor, like a you know lowest rung skilled labor and as an unskilled labor in various societies through world history. And, and he converts it all into a, a wheat ra ration in order to sort of level, in order to sort of um, deal with the problems of different currencies and stuff. And he finds that actually classical Athens did a pretty good job of, of paying its poorest workers, you know, pretty well. So and not course, only were the people at the bottom higher than the Persian yeah. bottom, but the people at the top were lower. So, so the inequality is much less. You don't want to go crazy at first. They weren't living in a modern welfare state. They, did, you know, didn't, they didn't have, uh, you know, an actual health system or anything. But in terms of the, the complete uh, mess that is human history, <laughs> they, they, weren't they, they, were, they weren't doing too bad. Yeah, um, yeah and so... You mentioned in, in the lectures something about like the camaraderie aspect and stuff, like fighting, um, fighting in a the shield wall. Yeah, the shield wall and stuff, yeah. and so you you're protecting the guy next to you, and therefore you yeah. become kind of a, a unit, and right, none right. of you can claim that you did better in the fight. Yeah, because yeah. everyone else will be like, no, we we're all, we we're all on that wall. Yeah, right. That, that's another thing that people because well, this is a big issue in in you know archaic Greek history. Uh, why is it or is it the case that they're more egalitarian if so why does this come about and and that what, what you're referring to is called the sort of hoplite reform theory the idea is they, they started fighting in this particular way at a certain point and then the evidence is pretty clear that they, they did <laughs> they fought in this particular way lined up uh with their shields kind of locked and you know kind of like some people say it's like a rugby scrum but it's like a scrum of like you know pretty broad front you know and, and spears and, and a few more spears yeah <laughs> exactly yeah you're allowed to do certain things you're not allowed to do in a, in a rugby scrum. But so, yeah, so, so, so the possibility is that they started fighting in this way and then it, it meant that uh, the sort of big men couldn't claim that they'd done everything themselves. If you look at the picture of warfare for the most part in the Homeric poems, which, you know, is a huge thorny question of what period that's meant to represent, if it's meant to represent any kind of coherent period. But if you look at the picture of warfare there, it's kind of like you have these champions, these heroes, and they, they drive up in the chariot. Often they have like a charioteer to help them. They jump off their chariots and they say, I'm a great Achilles, you're Hector, let's fight. Yeah. Um, and then they can go back and claim, look, I defend, Hector can go back in, not on that occasion, but <laughs> Hector can go back in and say, look, I defended the city. And then presumably that helps him, you know, bolster his power. Uh, and that's, once you have hoplite warfare, that's not available anymore. There's certain positions on the field uh, when you're doing hoplite warfare that you need a slightly stronger person so like sometimes the spartan king goes there but it's not much of a difference it's kind of like you know being tight head prop or something it's not like so which way do you think on your own? the causality goes was there an already egalitarian society that lended itself to yeah. fighting together yeah. or was it a society that fought together and therefore became egalitarian yeah that's the that's that's the question but but hoplite warfare uh, you know what's driving what and i think often in history history is often messy and you, you get what i would call recursive causation it's kind of like a recursive causality it's not like at some point they magically started doing hoplite warfare and then they became politically politically egalitarian it's also not like they were politically egalitarian like that and then suddenly they're like oh let's change to hoplite warfare it's more that these were trends that kind of supported each other mm. so you have this so you have the way that the, the slate is wiped clean after the bronze age collapse then you have um then you have this iron, uh, you know, distribution of iron thing. Then you have these economic differences. And the economic differences, too, it's like the, the, the political egalitarianism is supporting the economic egalitarianism and vice, and vice versa. Uh, you have the egalitarianism in the way they fight, which is supporting uh, the political egalitarianism and vice versa. And you've got all these other things going on, too. One of the biggest is ideology. You have these, these uh, egalitarian ideas, and that you know, relatively clear from some of the earliest texts we have, not so much the Iliad and the Odyssey, although some, there's some there too, but uh, Hesiod, for example, you know, he talks about the, you know, the bribe-eating judges in his community in Ascra. Uh, so pretty early on in Greek texts, you can find elements of this egalitarianism, that the little man should be able to stand up and criticize his rulers. And that's, uh, you know, it doesn't seem like much to us, but that's quite a big thing in human history. Yeah, it's a, that's a step above above the Assyrians and their towers of late people. That, that's right. Um, and, you know, maybe I don't know enough about that culture. Maybe they had some little elements of egalitarianism too. But if so, it didn't seem to get very far, right? Whereas in Greece, we have, we have a different dynamic where these ideological claims are supporting uh, political reforms. And as you move into the classical period, you get more and more democracies. And the political changes are supporting more and more expressions of egalitarian ideology.
So, we all know that modern democracies essentially take a lot from Athens, you know, maybe Sparta as well in Rome, but if modern democracies are influenced by Athens so much, why don't they share many of Athens' uh, features, like the assembly, or maybe more primarily democratic system? Okay, so, so that's a hu another hugely interesting question. Um, but the, the basic point, I think, is that um, they, they weren't, uh, modern democracies are not actually that, that influenced by, by ancient democracies, much less than, than we, na we nowadays like to think. Um, so, and, and that's because basically, you know, they had the ancient democratic thing, then there was the European Dark Ages and a lot of stuff that went down. And uh, for most of that period, the people, the educated people, the aristocrats who, were, who had the leisure to write history, they didn't think very highly of ancient democracy. They thought it was mob rule. They definitely didn't want to install it in their own societies, right? Because that would have meant uh, various bad things for them. And it's only really in the 19th century that you get people like George Grote, who's a great uh, liberal figure in England, in, in London, uh, who starts saying, actually, maybe Athenian democracy wasn't that bad. Uh, but, but that's kind of a, a sort of parallel thing. It's, it doesn't seem to be the case that modern representative democracy comes in because people are like, let's do what the Athenians did. And, and that's why modern democracies do look very different. Uh, so modern democracies, you know, they tend to come in through, uh, you know, parliaments and things like that, uh, attempts to limit the powers of the king uh, or, the, or the monarchy, thing, uh, things like that. Um, and, uh, and so if you look at the United States, for example, it's a very interesting case where we think of it as a democracy now, and there, there are good reasons for doing that. But uh, if you read the original uh, text by people like James Madison and Alexander Hamilton, uh, you know, there's a series of very famous uh, articles they wrote for newspapers called the Federalist Papers. And in those, it's pretty clear that they, they want the United States to be a, a mixed constitution. They, they think democracy is okay, but if you have too much democracy, that's going to be a bad thing. So uh, democracy is a lot, a lot the, even the representative democracies we have now, it's a lot more, they're a lot more recent than people tend to think. Um, and uh, and they're a lot more they're a lot more moderate and, and a lot of the, the, the people uh, they, they were they were a lot more moderate for much longer than people tend to think and a lot of those gains were very very hard won so you know it, it, Britain was in, in some ways one of the earliest representative democracies but if you if you look at the percent of the of, of people in Britain who were in the franchise even in the nineteenth century it's very very small. Even the, the Great Reform Acts, uh, 1832 and I think 1871, uh, you know, it's still a, a less than 10%, far less than 10% of, of people can actually, actually vote. So it's only really in the 20th century that we have even mass franchise. And then, and then even then you just have representative democracy. You don't have direct democracy, apart from maybe like Switzerland is maybe one, one counterexample. That's quite surprising uh, to me, like arguing from a point of ignorance because I don't much, know much about this. Because I would have thought that during the Renaissance, you know, when essentially all the artists and all the philosophers were looking back to like the ancients, they might have adopted more of their values and may have essentially um, constructed positions based on the themes that maybe were transferred to modern Yeah. Okay. Philosophies. But it seems yeah. like you're saying that they just happened to come to a relatively similar conclusion rather than built off the ancients. Yeah, it's more like convergent evolution. You yeah. Know? It's like they happened to, they discovered flight and, or something that looks similar through two different paths rather than it's a kind of genealogical relationship. But w w what you said was, was interesting because it's kind of like, um, in the Renaissance it's true that they were looking back to the ancients. That's basically what the Renaissance was, right? Um, but so what do you find when you look back to the ancient texts that talk about Athenian democracy? Okay, well, you read, you read Aristophanes, and he's kind of like, yeah, you know, Democrats are kind of fools sometimes. They make bad decisions often. You look at Thucydides, he's saying, yeah, democracies kind of, you know, make bad decisions. Look at Plato, he says, democracy is a terrible system. It's like government by dumbasses. So all the sources that they're reading actually have this strongly uh, anti-democratic bias. Not all of them, but, but, you know, a lot of them have a pretty substantial anti-democratic bias. So, um... Uh, that's the curious thing about ancient democracies that we, we know that this practice existed. The Athenians were practicing democracy for nearly two hundred years, but um, but there, there aren't actually we don't really have that many pro democratic sources from left from the ancient world. You know, what one uh, exception is uh, this figure Protagoras that I'm personally very interested in, and if you read Plato's Protagoras, there's a big speech where he talks about democracy. 
but uh, there's not much else around uh, than that. And part of that's because, you know, the, the, the people who really liked democracy in the ancient world would have been the poorer people, and they would have had less time to write about stuff. And less likely to be literate. Yeah, in yeah the exactly, place. exactly. Yeah, and part of it's just um, the bias of the people who copied the ancient texts and, and preserved them for the modern world was already a bit anti-democratic, so that they really liked Plato and Aristotle for various reasons, but uh, there may have been things that they, they didn't choose to copy that we've lost. So, so what you're saying is a lot of the a lot of it's just bias of the sources. By the time you're a 17th century person trying to look back at the ancients, all your sources are anti-democratic. Yeah, or, and then also, at, least, at the very least, not pro-democratic. Yeah, and, and the chances are too, even in the 17th century, that if you're literate and you have time to, to think about ancient history, and you know Greek and Latin, you're probably not from the lower class. Or at least you, you know there's some people who did rise to the lower classes, but there's a huge bias towards money, the, the money classes even there. So you're looking at these anti-democratic sources, you already have a slight anti-democratic democratic inclination yourself. And that means it's really, in some ways, it's no surprise that it's only in the 19th century with George Grote and others that people are like, hold on a minute, maybe they, maybe it wasn't just mob rule. You know? Yeah, maybe it was something better. Yeah. Um, something else that I kind of wanted to get into is, and we covered this in our essay as well, was the Athenian Empire, also known as the Delian League. Yeah. Um, and I just kind of wanted to talk about how you think, like, like what, what, are your, what are your thoughts on that? Um, like, in, in terms of the, a, a democracy running, running an empire, um, yeah. and, and how that went, and, and so maybe just the... Well, no, that's another big, big question of Athenian democracy, you know, the pros and cons, the sort of, you look at the, the kind of um, the rap sheet, as it were, of the Athenian democracy, how did it do? People who are critical of it will say, you know, well, A, they excluded women that had slaves and stuff, and B, they ran this exploitative empire. Although pragmatically, maybe that was a good thing for them, having an empire. Well, uh, yeah, if you look at it from the purely, <laughs> if you look at it from a very dark kind of Darwinian performance perspective, it got the money, so <laughs> it must and, have and been actually, good. you know, to be fair, this is a brutal world, and, you know, ancient states are constantly competing with each other, and, you know, if you read the Mytilinean debate, that both the speakers are urging that, you know, the thing they need to, to think about above all is self-preservation, but, but maybe that's Thucydides. But anyway, no, so the Athenian Empire, okay, so it's, it's a problem. Um, uh, so uh, I think, in, just to give you a kind of overview uh, of the field of the you know, Athenian Empire studies subfield over the last 100 years or so, uh, maybe even 200 years, basically there, there's, uh, there are a lot of people who say this was an exploitative empire we should look at it very similarly to, say, the Persian, the Achaemenid Persian Empire, which also, you know, elicited gifts from the periphery, went to the center, people at the center were dominant, they used it, then they used violence to, and you could, yeah, to you reinforce could, you that system. Leave. Yeah, and, and I think another way of looking at the Athenian Empire, or the Delian League, as some people would, you know, <laughs> prefer to keep calling it even after the middle of the century, is uh, it wasn't quite that, okay? They, they expl <laughs> there was some exploitation uh, later on, they certainly did some very awful things like forcing Milos into uh, the empire, massacres. Um, Almost destroying Mytilene. Uh, yeah, although actually they let them off in the end, didn't they? But, uh, you know, establishing clerarchies, which is when you just come to the other place, you know, you go to the other island and you just give, you take their land and you give uh, bits of it to Athenian citizens. So there's no doubt that they did things like that. However, um, if you look at the early days of the League, it's pretty clear that uh, well, it's clear from Thucydides, at least if you believe him, that uh, the Allies wanted Athenian leadership at that point, after Pausanias, the Spartan, had sort of gone a bit crazy. Um, and it seems like in the early days of the League, when Cimon was a general, that they were using the, the League resources to take the fight to the Persians. So a way of looking, so the, the most sort of sanguine people about the Athenian Empire will say, well, look, the Athenians are actually using these resources to provide certain types of public goods. You know, they're clearing the seas of pirates, they're clearing the seas of, of Persians, um, and, you know, security is increasing as a result, prosperity is increasing as a result. Um, and then uh, you, you also have this aspect of uh, democracy versus oligarchy. Now, of course, it's, it's not the case that everyone in the Athenian Empire was a democracy, but it seems like on the whole, the empire supported democracies. Um, and you can see this in the Peloponnesian War pretty clearly that it's basically Sparta and the Peloponnesian League supporting oligarchies and a Athens uh, uh, supporting democracies. So there's the great um, Marxist historian Geoffrey de Saint-Croix who had this thesis about the Athenian Empire uh, 
which is that all the poor people in the Allied states actually supported Athens because they knew that Athens, or they thought that Athens would you know, help them preserve democracies and they liked democracies because they were the poor guys, right? And on the other hand, the elites in these city-states tended to support Sparta and tended to support uh, oligarchy. So, you know, I think that um, my own position is probably further towards the second one of these, of these views. I think that you know, there, there was a lot of exploitation, there were, there were massacres, there were definitely lots of terrible things the Athenian Empire did. But I think we should, we should be careful in history not to lump everybody into the same category. And I think there's a pretty clear difference to me between uh, uh, this empire that starts out as a, starts out as a cooperative league and kind of, um, dis, uh, sort of, what's the word I'm trying to think of, degrades into something else. There's a difference between that and you know, these empires that just they exist entirely to dominate and to extract rents and things like that. I think that's more what's going yeah. on with the Syria. And the way you obtain your empire as well. It's yeah. quite different. If you're in the near Assyrian Empire and you go around invading people and flaying them, yeah. Whereas if people voluntarily join you but then want to leave, it's a little bit yeah. It's a different. It's a little bit different because the Assyrian deal is basically like we're with Asher. If you're with Asher, that's great. If you're not, we're going to impale you. And you know that's a pretty clear choice. And uh, you know it has its advantages in terms of clarity. But the Athenian one is a bit more complicated than that. It's kind of like okay, we have this pre-existing league against the Persians. We need money to run it. Um, and then a lot of the uh, allied states, this is again something Thucydides tells us, they choose to start giving money rather than ships. And then they're in this position, oops, we, we don't have any ships anymore because we decided to just give Athens money and stop running our own navies. And then the Athenians have all this power. And I see at that point, the Athenians do, you know, make a moral error and, and uh, you know, they use their force in ways maybe they shouldn't have. But it's, it's a slightly different ballgame, I think. How, what do the sources say about how the Athenians viewed, viewed their empire? Like, did the Athenian citizens, or government, if you will, which kind of was the citizens, did they view their empire in a positive light? Well, again, so this is a good question for source criticism and things like this. So if you look at Thucydides, there's speakers in Thucydides who definitely say things like, you know, we have an arche, we have, we have an empire. And, uh, you know, if you read the uh, Melian Dialogue, and the Mytilenean debate, especially yeah, these Cleon are both places. Yeah, says it repeatedly. Yeah, where they both say, like, you know, uh, we've gained the empire now, and we'd be fools not to defend it. It would get us into even more trouble, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but then, so that's, that's Thucydides putting words into the mouth of other people. Because he, he wasn't there, was he? Um, well, he was... At the debate. Oh, well, yeah, okay. So he, he, he gets exiled at a certain point. But he, of course, was a general earlier on in the war. He failed to... Uh, to uh, defend Amphipolis against Brasidas. Uh, but there, there, there are lots of things that he, he, he probably wasn't present at himself, but and then it's any, he hides his sources, really, so it's, it's anybody's guess what, how he knew those things or how he thought he knew those things. But, like, you know, he, he probably he could have had a friend who was, uh, who was present at some of these debates. The, my Linnean ones before he was exiled, so he may well have been there. But, like, you know, when there's three generals talking to each other around uh, Syracuse, He's almost certainly not there. Whether or not he had like reliable information from other people who were there, that's like something that's impossible. But to know. E- even if he did have information from people who were there, reliable, like you're not going to be getting verbatim quotes. Exactly, um, and, and he says that. You look at the beginning of Thucydides. He tells you, "I'm gonna, I'm gonna put some speeches in here, and scholars pour over this." This guy I just mentioned, Geoffrey de Saint Croix, he writes a lot about this particular question of like, what does Thucydides mean by this? But what Thucydides says is. I basically followed the main gist of the arguments of the speeches, and then I filled in what I think was appropriate. <laughs> so it's kind of like, well, what did you think was appropriate? Was it just like, you know, is it sort of he's rewriting the speeches so that they sound good? Maybe. Uh, yeah. <laughs> fun, fun source to, yeah. uh, to and have the, to and the dissect. Just, the speeches are really good. So. so. <laughs> but yeah, it does mean that you have to take specific quotes of quite a quite a big grain of salt. That's right. Um, that, that, that's kind of like the number one lesson, especially for first year uh, classics in ancient history, is just what do we really know? Uh, we have to be very cautious. Um, but yeah, that kind of that question about the Athenians if they approved of their empire or not kind of brings us on, uh, into the next thing, which is what was like the Athenian perspective on the morals of their democracy? Like, did they think, for example, that oh, we're better than the Spartans morally because we vote and they don't? Or did they just think about it pragmatically? Or? Yeah, so this is another source problem where, we don't, we, as I said before, we don't have that much writing by Democrats from Athens, kind of surprisingly. 
but the sense that we get is that there was this ideological divide in, in the world at that time. Kind of like, you know, some people, people used to compare it, certainly when I was a lot younger, to the Cold War, mm. you know. So like it's oligarchy like that, versus yeah, it's like, Sparta uh, versus Athens, oligarchy yeah. versus democracy. And they're seen as the two kind of superpowers who are supporting each side. And it's certainly not the case that everybody thinks oligarchy is crap and it's, it's just oligarchs dominating them. Oh, there is that aspect to it. Uh, but there are people who are convinced oligarchs and, and some of them are Athenians. You know, an interesting example is this guy Xenophon, who's a very clever uh, sort of entrepreneurial type of dude. He was a student of Socrates. He was a mercenary in Persia at one point. He wrote a lot of different works, and he just liked Sparta. He was a so-called laconophile, and he eventually uh, moved there. But so it seems like the, the basic division was Democrats would would be uh, they, they would say they were in favor of yes, democratia, uh, but that's actually a relatively later term. Uh, earlier on in the fifth century, they tend to talk about isonomia, which means equality of the laws or equality before the law. Uh, they talk about isegoria, equality of speech. They talk about paresia, which is uh, frank speech or free speech, and they say that their systems provide all of these goods. Um, and uh, yeah, there are various little passages uh, that you can look at, um, you know, where, where Democrats have a say. So, you know, Herodotus, uh, the Persian constitutional debate, which is almost certainly made up, uh, you know, one of the Persians what, puts forward. What do you mean, here. Herodotus making stuff up? Uh, How can you say such a thing? He says later on, people always say I made this up, but it's true, but it's probably not. Anyway, so we, we have little passages like that where, where Democrats speak for their, for their worldview and, you know, uh, they say certain things. And, and on the other side, too, we know that oligarchs had their own worldview and, and they tended to present that in terms of eunomia. And that literally means good laws. Uh, we might translate it good government or something like that. So that, that's what they thought they were selling. They thought they were selling stability basically and and uh and things like that and of course you know different oligarchs had different theories and someone like plato went very extremely towards very very restricted oligarchies uh, in his ideal states of philosopher kings um, but you know most people i think would, would have just said something like the better sort the, the aristocratic sort of people should rule and that's something that we see reflected in uh in the so-called old oligarch, which is this one text we have where the, where the guy basically says, yeah, democracy, you know, is, they, they do pretty good, the Democrats do a pretty good job, but it's a bad system because it's the bad people who are in charge. You know, the bad people we, meaning we, like the yeah, lower the, class. The riff yeah, riff. exactly. That's right. um, but that's kind of interesting because that, that brings me to, it, to another question, which is that you keep referring to aristocrats in Athens, but it's also a, quite a stringent, direct democracy. So how do those two systems work together? Like an aristocracy and a direct democracy? What were the role of aristocrats and what sort of powers did they have or, or lack thereof? Yeah, that's another interesting question. And it, it, it's, it's really interesting for historians, especially, I think, because you know, if you're a political theorist, you kind of tend to think of these things in the abstract, like, oh, let's just design a system. But of course, you have a sort of backstory to every society. And the backstory to Greek society is that, although they're not as um, hierarchical as some of the systems in the Near East, they do have an aristocracy. And you, you look at the archaic period, the aristocrats have a pretty distinctive culture, you know, based around athletics and the symposium and uh, the gymnasium. And, uh, you know, you can see that reflected in the, in the poems of Pindar, uh, what, you know, which is already moving into the classical period. Um, so there's this aristocratic culture. Um, and then they suddenly have these very strong direct democracies, as you say. And uh, in some places, they react to this just by, like, killing them and kicking them out. <laughs> If you look at their Problem Robinson solved. book, yeah, they, there's a lot of examples of that. And Aristotle, at one point, you know, later in the in the late fourth century, he says he he recommends to Democrats not to do that because he says it's kind of counterproductive. You don't you don't want to like squeeze them till the pip squeak because you you want to try and kind of co-opt and integrate the aristocrats into your system. And I think that's basically what the Athenians do. They they, they don't go into any kind of major purging type things. Um, no well, French Revolution. Uh, no, this level. doesn't seem to be off with their heads in general. I mean, maybe some individual aristocrats got ostracized from time to time. And certainly, if they, um, you know, once you get to like the thirty tyrants and stuff, then that that's different. But in in general, if you're, you, it, it's very much a path open for you in Athens to be a rich person who is down with the democracy and contributes. And so that's why they have this this taxation system, where as I said before you are asked to provide a warship for a year 
or you're asked to um, to uh, pay for a theatrical performance. So was um so was the Athenian aristocracy more just monetary based than like you were considered an aristocrat if you were rich, or was it the more traditional you had to be from the right family? It's a it's a mix of both things, and and it's it actually reminds me a lot of when I was living in England. I had some similar a kind of thing where it's a democratic political culture, and then but you have this sort of uh, backstory of there's a more aristocratic segment to the society and it, it, it is correlated with wealth but uh, you can be extremely wealthy and not be posh right and it's the same it's the same thing in Athens that uh, uh, you know you, it's best to be from the right families some of the people like Cleon and some of the other so-called new politicians in the in the late fifth century people like Thucydides and Aristophanes uh, hate them uh, because they're not well born, but they a lot of them are quite rich, and, and that's uh, that's something that actually like loses them points with Aristophanes and Thucydides. It's kind of like you guys are like nouveau riche, uh, so they don't, they don't like that. So the ma main signs of aristocratic belonging, I'd say, it was you know landed wealth helps a lot, doing the right kind of culture, you know, symposia and uh, and, and education in the in the great poets, um, musical education, athletic achievement, uh, competing in the great pan panhellenic games. Those are all those all things which which get you cred, uh, get you street cred, as it were, <laughs> as an aristocrat. If you can get street cred as an aristocrat, um, but the the interesting thing is maybe that, you get a cocktail party cred or something. Yeah, 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 exactly. Interesting thing is that even though you have this very well defined segment of society, a very well defined aristocratic culture, they don't control things, right? They, they they're around and they're influential. They speak more often than the poor people in the assembly. But they're not in charge, and we can see this because as soon as they piss off the demos, even Pericles, he get he gets in trouble, he gets fined, and so they, they always have to make sure that they don't that they, that they're good democrats, they don't go too far, otherwise they know that they're going to get in trouble. Is that uh, exclusive to Athens? Because I know that Sparta had two kings, who by the end had no real power at all. Uh, was that like indicative of the greatest Spartan aristocracy? Like. So to be an oligarch in Sparta, did you have to be from the right families as well, or did you just have to be rich? Well, this is a, another complicated thing because um, for the Spartan royal families, the Agiads and the and the Europontid lines, that, that that those were just the two royal families. That's sort of something in itself, separate from the rest of the aristocracy. But one interesting thing about Sparta and a lot of the oligarchies, is, uh, which differentiated them from the democracies in Athens, is that. In Athens, as long as you were the right kind of male citizen with the right kind of background, you could be a citizen even if you were poor, right? Even if you're just a potter. So in Sparta, you actually have a property requirement for citizenship. And that means you have to have the right amount of land and you have to be able to produce the right amount of wheat. So in a sense, like all of the Spartan citizens are aristocrats. And they have this ideology that they're all equals. They're called homoioi. And all, everyone in the Spartan citizenry is equal. Of course, it's completely false. We we know from sources that some of them are much more equal than others. Much more exactly, much more equal than others. Okay, um, and that kind of I think what we should maybe finish on is the effects of all this, like on the actual people. So, if you were an Athenian, um, you're so maybe you don't vote, and so but is your life how free are you relative to a Spartan? Like, do you have your, as you were talking about before? Do you have your freedom of speech and do you have your freedom of movement and all that? Um, as part of this democracy, or do you just kind of get to vote, and that's that's about that's about it? Yeah, I don't think you really have too much freedom of speech when you can get sentenced to death for uh, what was it, uh, polluting the minds of the youth? <laughs> yes. Yeah. So so okay. So this is uh, wow. So many complicated things. I feel like I keep saying this is a complicated thing, but you know, it's uh, it's it's ancient history. You never really know. You, you don't really have that much information. You never really know which which sources to believe, but. Um, that's been debated, like how free was Athens intellectually? Okay, so what you're referring to is the most famous case that they killed Socrates. And they did, you know, they, they did. And they, and they said it was because, as you said, he was introducing new gods and corrupting the youth. Um, uh, but some people would say, well, that, that's a particular situation where it's after the 30 tyrants, you have this amnesty where, you know, the Athenians say, we're not going to prosecute people who were involved with the 30 tyrants. Uh, except for the 30 tyrants themselves, they, they sort of forgive everything. And then Socrates, who's associated with some of the people who are in the 30 tyrants, he keeps doing his sort of anti-democratic shtick. And, you know, that, so it doesn't excuse what the Athenians did there, but it may explain it. And the question is, was that a typical case? And it seems like 
It probably wasn't. You know, we hear a lot of stories, things like Anaxagoras uh, got in trouble for saying that the, that the sun was a burning rock. Pretty close to the truth, actually. But anyway, uh, <laughs> no, not a god. Uh, but a lot of those stories, they come from later sources, and they're not very good sources. So, and, you know, some people think that, that actually Athens was, you know, a pretty free place. Um, and, that, and you have to remember, you know, Socrates was pretty, is, if we can believe Plato, and Plato himself, too, both of them were, like, pretty strong critics of democracy for all their lives. And uh, Socrates lived to a pretty good age. <laughs> of course, they killed him in the end, but, you know, and Pl Pl Plato was allowed to do what he did for a long time. Aristotle, you know, at some point he has to flee, <laughs> but, uh, again, he, he, he is able to live and work there for a long time. And it seems like Athens actually attracted intellectuals. And so if, it, it doesn't seem to be the case that it's this, it's this place where everybody's in fear of speaking their mind, because if it was... Why, why would you go there? there? Yeah. That's a good point. Um, okay, cool. Is there anything uh, I, any just, of, just, either of you wanted to say? I've just got minor questions, not really related to any overall theme. It would be, how do you actually determine who is an Athenian citizen? Like, if some random other Greek person just ruled in there, hmm. would there actually be any method of determining if he's not a citizen? Oh, no. Or him from this, the was this going to be like, the last question? Because I, I could speak about this for like an hour. Oh, no. Because yeah, yeah. no, actually, I've actually done research on this. Accidentally doubles the lid <laughs> of the I'll, I'll, I'll give you like a very... I'll try and give you a really quick answer. So basically, the way that they did it... Because uh, they didn't have computer databases in those days. They didn't have ID right. like, cards. Really? Yeah, it's amazing. Oh, that's crazy. Well, okay, you have to be careful. You have to be careful with ancient history. We haven't yet found archaeological evidence of computer databases. Because, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, sometimes there's aliens who bring out stuff. But um, they, they probably didn't have databases or ID cards. So uh, what they did is they did it through groups, um, meaning like people would have been uh, members of deems, which you probably know are like these villages, the sort of precincts of ancient uh, Athens. And so what would happen is that you get voted. Uh, when you turned 18, you go in front of your deemsmen. And they'd say, yeah, you look like you're 18. We remember you growing up. And, and we know who your mother was. We know what who sort of size was. were these, were the deems? Uh, probably on average, between two and 400 citizens. Um, of course, more people if you include all the slaves and stuff and the women. But well, there's not really, I mean, people. people. They're slaves. Well, <laughs> Do they count? You're getting <laughs> too much into the ancient mindset. Well, I don't know, actually. Maybe the... Uh, you, it's only really Aristotle who, who had gone that far, I think. Yeah. Everybody <laughs> else admitted they were people, they were just probably, good for doing work. Yeah, probably just a bit, people of a different status. But anyway, uh, so, so your deem would do the vote, and, and if there was any doubt, there were these other groups that you were involved in. So a fratry, I don't know if you've heard of those, but fratries were these kinship groups, and they had a big festival every year called the Apaturia, and you'd be, when you were a little kid, your father would bring you, and then again when you were a teenager. And he'd say to all his chums in the fratry, hey guys, this is my son, you know, and they'd be like, cool, yeah, and they'd remember you, and that's the point. And then, so if you got in trouble later on, like, uh, we have legal speeches, <laughs> like those ones on my shelf, uh, from Athenian courts, and, and, and it's, often, it's quite common that people accuse others of not being real citizens. And what happens when, when, that, when, when that's the accusation is that you appeal to your deansmen and to your fellow fratry members. You bring them to court with you and, and you say, okay, this is guy's a witness that he saw me when I was 15 uh, at the Apaturia and he can remember that my father was a citizen and he remembers that my father also brought my mother in and presented her and everyone said, oh yeah, you sound like an Athenian native and stuff like that. So it's all done through personal connections, basically. Mm, I see. So, so it's, a gi it's a giant networking system, really. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so did it happen? Do you think that if you, if you didn't have the right connections that people would just you call you not a citizen and you you lose all your all your rights or was it was it pretty much guaranteed that that you could prove you were a citizen if you were a citizen this is really hard for us to know again because we have these legal speeches but we we don't often know like who won the case and we and we never know like who was right we know we never know who's actually in the right yeah if you were actually right. a citizen we don't have any like knockdown evidence mm. so but it, you know it seems like some of the people who are accused of not being citizens yeah, they're pretty dodgy. Like so, <laughs> they so probably they, were. Like they have a heavy foreign accent and stuff like that. People are like you really think it's because remember in those days that you had to, you know, well, in Athens, citizenship was defined by you have to have both parents born in Athens. So that's one way in which they were less liberal than us, right? So uh, I think so, some of these cases are a little bit dodgy. But like th there's one guy, there's one speech where the guy is like, uh, I think he says. Uh, I think he's from, he said, he's from, I'm from this particular deem, 
uh, Talamus or something like that. I can't remember. And then, uh, or Dekalaya, and 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 he says, if you go to this particular barber shop, that's where all the people hang out. And the, and I think at one point the the other side of the argument says, oh, actually we went to this barber shop and like nobody's ever heard of you. <laughs> so that that's kind of a smoking gun because if you, if your demonsmen don't know who you are, you the people that you claim are in your village. If they don't know who you are, that's weird. It's a bit suspicious. Because it's a, it's a society where like everybody knows each other. There's only like two to four hundred people. The biggest dean probably had like a thousand citizens. But even that, like he probably would have seen the guy before. Yeah. So you would have. I mean, it's it's like a it's like a medium sized high school. You you'd still seen their yeah, face. Yeah. Like you know them to see, as they say. Yeah, and particularly if they've got a weird accent, you might remember. Yeah, yeah, you know, Canadians and stuff. That would yeah, certainly. yeah. No, I mean, yeah. you wouldn't want them being citizens for sure. No, of course not. Um. Okay. Well, I think we're. Just about ready to wrap it up, unless you had anything you wanted to say, James? No, no, that was good. That was good. No, normally people don't listen to me go on about Dean Democracy for that long. So. Oh. Yeah, well... Well, we, unless they have to, like in, in the lecture. Yeah, we, we, we have to take it. We get stuck, yeah. We, we're stuck in the middle of a row and you can't leave. Yeah, exactly. Well, thanks very much. Yeah, and, thanks. Um, yeah, thanks.